Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you with us. Uh, my name is Ben Cahill. I'm a senior fellow in the Energy Security and Climate Change Program at CSIS. And we're really pleased to be hosting this event today on methane emissions from the oil and gas industry. Um, this is an issue that has garnered a huge amount of attention, especially in the last year, uh, with some really exciting progress last fall, but we have a long way to go. At CSIS, we have been focusing on different ways to reduce methane emissions from the global gas sector. So we're going to share some of that research today. And I'm really excited that we have two terrific guests and experts to discuss the issue of methane and oil and gas with us. And I'll just introduce them briefly right now and then quickly again later. So we have two special guests. The first is Mary Street. She is BP's Senior Vice President for the Americas for Communications and Advocacy. She leads a team from across the Americas, and in her role, she's responsible for public policy, government relations, and communications in the Americas region. So welcome, Mary. We also have Mark Brownstein, who is Senior Vice President for Energy at Environmental Defense Fund, and he leads EDF's pro program globally with a focus on halting the rise of global oil and gas emissions on a path that's consistent with the 2050 zero carbon future. So two really important voices on this issue. And the way that we're going to proceed today is that I'll start out with um, a quick summary of our research. I'll share a couple slides summarizing some of the work that we've done uh, in the last couple months. And then I'll hand it over to Mary and to Mark for a couple minutes of opening comments each. And then we'll have a moderated Q&A. Um, so I would direct your attention to the Q&A button. Uh, those of you who are joining the participants, you should be able to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. I will keep an eye on that. Uh, throughout the event today. I'll try to get to those questions towards the end, maybe group a couple together. So do add your questions into the Q&A feature and we'll all be able to see that. And with that, I think I'm going to start sharing my screen. And I'll just quickly summarize some of the work that CSIS has done on methane emissions and global gas. So we had a lot of progress on the methane front last year. Um, at the COP26 conference in Glasgow, we had the signature of the Global Methane Pledge, which is a collective agreement to cut methane emissions around the world by 30% by the year 2030. 112 countries have signed that as of last week. The number is still growing steadily and ticking up. We also had last fall proposed methane standards from the US Environmental Protection Agency, which would apply to both new and existing sources of methane emissions from the oil and gas industry, a really important step forward. And in the European Union, we have proposed methane legislation in December, which again has some pretty important implications for how companies do measurement, reporting, and verification of methane emissions. It will create some new standards for people who want to import gas into the EU. So there was a lot of uh, momentum around methane, certainly in the run-up to COP26 and afterwards. And the question that we've been asking ourselves at CSIS is, what does all this mean for the global LNG industry? So a couple of core questions that we're trying to answer. Um, first, how will momentum build beyond the United States and the European Union to other regions around methane cuts? Um, and in particular, how is this going to work in other countries where you don't have the same predominance of you know, private listed companies in the oil and gas industry, but rather you have a lot of state-owned utilities and national oil companies that dominate these energy sectors? Clearly, they have a different set of drivers. So how will this process take place? And then a last really interesting question is, will we see the market evolve in such a way that there's a premium for cleaner, quote unquote, or less emissions intensive gas? Um, I think there are a lot of questions about data and uh, the drivers for individual companies and how closely they're monitoring this. So these are some of the core questions that we tried to answer. Uh, we published a final report a couple of weeks ago. And what I'm gonna do now is just spend a little bit of time touching on some of the key themes from that research. Um, and we've grouped them into you know 12 big themes. So first, it was clear from all the interviews that we did, and I spoke with about you know 25 different companies in formal interviews, and had lots of informal conversations with global gas players, so LNG sellers, buyers, financial institutions, regulators, and others. It's clear that at this point, emissions intensity is really not a big factor in global gas trade or LNG trade. Um, you know. Price, volume, delivery terms, commercial terms, these are the things that drive deals. Emissions intensity is something that people are looking at more, but it's not really a core commercial driver for companies yet. 
A second theme that came out of these conversations is that when we think about methane emissions, companies are really focused on their own operational emissions, in particular their scope one emissions. Um, so if you are tasked with cutting your methane emissions from operations, you're really gonna focus on those assets that are under your operational control. And if we think about gas buyers in Asia, that often means pipelines and storage tanks and power plants and other things that they own and operate. It's not necessarily clear yet that the way they buy gas is gonna be you know, main lever to do this. Another really important theme that jumped out from these conversations is that from the perspective of a lot of Asian buyers, especially in South Asia and Southeast Asia, you know, which tend to be more price sensitive, there's already this really strong perception that switching from coal to gas is already a big climate win. You know, it's often quite expensive to substitute gas for coal and power generation. Uh, it's unfamiliar for some companies in these regions. They're just starting to do it. Um, and they already see that as a big, a big move, something that's difficult for them to do and a climate victory of sorts. So from their perspective, asking them to pay attention to emissions intensity, you know, on top of this is kind of a big ask at this point. And that point was reinforced by many people that I talked to. Fourth point here, a lot of these conversations inevitably come back to carbon neutral LNG. Carbon neutral LNG, so-called picked up in 2019, it's relatively recent. We saw a big wave of deals in 2020 and early 2021. The pace has cooled a little bit this year. And I think views on carbon neutral LNG are really divided. You know, some people see this as a solution or something that companies can do to try to reach net zero goals in the near term. Others see it as more of a fad and a distraction. Um, and I think there are real core problems with carbon neutral LNG. You know, the quality of the underlying emissions accounting, the quality of the carbon offsets that this trade depends on, just the scale of emissions from an LNG cargo that have to be offset. And basically the way this is all framed up is it really a means of cutting emissions. Um, so pr some problems with carbon neutral LNG. And again, I think that the pace of these deals has really slowed in recent months. Um, another theme here is that there are bigger long-term threats to LNG than just methane intensity. You know, if you talk to a lot of LNG sellers, you know, they're basically concerned about the long-term position of gas relative to renewable energy. You know, there's a lot of price sensitivity. There is a concern that if we've got this big run-up in spot prices, like we've seen in Europe and Asia in recent months, it's hard for gas to compete. Over the long term, that will be a big challenge. So methane intensity is important, and it's, uh, you know, it's obviously very important to financial institutions and others that are starting to look at these issues, maybe not top of mind yet. And that brings me to the final point here, which is that, you know, financial backers of LNG projects and LNG companies, they're not yet pushing hard on methane intensity. They're aware of it, but it's not really a key driver for them in terms of, you know, risking projects. To continue with this, you know, if we think about Asian utilities, there might be bigger levers for them to cut methane than LNG. As I mentioned, looking at things like, you know, the assets that they operate and control, like storage tanks and pipelines. There are a lot of downstream gas leaks that could be fixed. That's quite important. And for them, maybe that's priority number one, a quicker, faster way to reduce uh, methane emissions that they operate. Uh, another interesting point to me was that if we think about the big Asian buyers, say you know, the major gas utilities like Ajera or Cogas, some of the biggest LNG buyers in the world, if you look at their long-term energy plans, a lot of them are actually looking to hydrogen you know, gas to meet their net zero goals. And I think that does create the risk that you know, cleaner or less emissions intensive gas will be somewhat lost in the shuffle uh, in the years to come. Another theme that jumped out at me is that <clears throat> so far the impact of the global methane pledge is a little bit uncertain. So Japan, South Korea, many other governments to sign the global methane pledge. There hasn't really been the directive that says, okay, um, if you're a utility, what does this mean for you? How should it change the way that you buy gas? That could happen, but it's still somewhat early days. A couple final points here. Data providers have a really important role to play. If we're going to standardize and spread data on emissions intensity and methane intensity, in particular of LNG cargos, one of the big questions to me is how do the data providers step up and do this? Refinitiv, you know, Bloomberg, you know, Reuters, all these institutions, plats that make data available and spread it throughout the industry. We have to standardize it, and those guys have a key role to play. Um, familiarity with methane detection, which I think Mary will talk about, varies quite a bit among the Asian players. Some are doing this. A lot are quite unfamiliar with it and kind of lack the confidence in the data. And then the last point, which I think is really important for a US audience is cleaner gas could really be a big potential competitive advantage for the US LNG industry. 
And a few companies that I spoke with said, look, we have the right alignment of investor pressure, shareholder pressure, data, and all the things that we need to do to provide cleaner gas to the marketplace. And US LNG can lead in this way. And that, that I think is why you've seen some companies like Chenier make early moves to, to innovate and to create some new ways of, you know, doing this detailed emissions intensity life cycle analysis and offering that to customers. And I think it's early days, but they're trying to establish a market there. So I'm gonna stop sharing here. And that was really just kind of food for thought. It's a snapshot. I think what I wanna emphasize here is that this is a really fast evolving space. Everything around methane is evolving so quickly because of voices like Mark Brownstein and, and EDF and many others who are pushing companies on this. And I think just in the last couple of months since these interviews, you know, things are evolving, but this is kind of a sense of where the Asian players are and how they're thinking about this. So we'll table some of this and bring it up in conversation later, but I'm gonna stop there and I would love to hand it over to Mary Street from DP to give her an opportunity to give us a couple of opening comments for a few minutes. So Mary, over to you. Thank you, Ben. And thanks for inviting uh, me to participate in this conversation this morning. Um, it's, we've been working with CSIS, EDF, and probably many of the participants on this call for a number of years on methane. And the topic is, is really, it's critically important and, and timely. So thank you for doing this. Before we really dive into the conversation, I wanna just talk a bit about BP's more recent journey. Um, since 2020, BP announced um, a new ambition to be net zero by 2050 or sooner and help the world get there, as well as uh, a new strategy. And that really, um, it's transforming from an international oil company focused on developing resources to an integrated energy company focused on delivering solutions for customers. And this involves really transforming the way, um, you know, that our energy system works. I mean, we think about the top emitters and, and it's energy and industry, um, and transport, and that accounts for 70% of global emissions. So at BP, we're on this journey. We've announced the 2050 goal, but we have um, we have interim targets on absolute emission reductions, um, which uh, for 2025 and 2030, as well as um, around methane. And what we've said on methane is that we plan to install methane measurement at all of our existing um, major oil and gas sites by 2023, publish the data, and then drive a 50% reduction in methane intensity in our own operations. And we can talk more about that, but I think first, um, you know, first and foremost, we've got to look at ourselves, as, as you mentioned, Ben, our operational emissions, our scope one and two emissions, as well as um, the scope uh, three emissions, but methane intensity um, and driving that down is critical. And then also um, driving down the and encouraging our, our partners um, that we work with without, where we're not operating to also drive theirs uh, down as well. So it's gonna be um, critical that, you know, one player can't do this alone. Um, in the US BP, we have called for the direct federal regulation of methane and we're working um, with partners and, and others like EDF and uh, EPA on making sure that rule um, is, is gets in place, but also allows for all of the different technologies that are um, being used now to, to really get to the problem and for, um, you know, so that we can really get to actual measurement. Um, so a really well-designed regulation is important ensuring that everyone in the industry is doing their part and uh, look forward to the discussion here and getting into more of these issues. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Mary. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of water for conversation I think later on we'll get into some of the details. Um, Mark, let me hand it over to you for some opening comments. Yeah, well, thanks, Ben. It's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to be talking about this topic with Mary. Uh, EP of course has been, um, a good partner on this issue for quite some time and has shown some real leadership both uh, in the U.S. and uh, and globally. Uh, so glad to have the opportunity to uh, talk uh, talk about this with the rest of the CSIS community. Um, I'd like to sort of think about three points here. 
uh, Ben. First of all, picking up on your presentation, uh, you and I were both at the uh, World Gas Conference last week in South Korea. Um, and I think one of the things that was most startling to me uh, was frankly just how much the methane issue was uh, a major topic of conversation. Uh, in that room amongst uh, gas suppliers and gas consumers around the world. Um, I'd like to think that, you know, Environmental Defense Fund uh, has had something to do with that over the years, but the truth of the matter is, is that the conversation now has really taken off. Uh, and this is something that I think is a common topic of conversation amongst the industry, whether or not we're in the room. And I think that that's a, that's a good thing. Um, I think it's also really significant to note that while uh, obviously the the global gas community is very much um, you know processing the geopolitical uncertainties uh, that have been created because of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and the follow-on effects that that's had on the global uh, oil and gas markets, uh, the fact of the matter is is that uh, the global gas community is still very much. Uh, not only talking about methane emissions, but also talking about decarbonization, that uh, we're not in a situation where the industry has decided that uh, for the sake of uh, meeting uh, future energy demands, that somehow uh, they get a pass or that they get the opportunity to put the whole decarbonization issue on hold while they attend to more immediate business. I think the, the general sense that I got from that room is, is that there is a real belief uh, that decarbonization is a is a sustained trend in the industry. It is a fact that the industry is going to that needs to wrestle with, and that whatever happens in the short term, um, um, the long term trend is undeniable. Um, so, with that as kind of preface, I would say that I, I'm actually not surprised that the global gas industry continues to focus on methane emissions. Of course, we know that methane drives uh, more than a quarter of the warming our planet is experiencing right now. Uh, we know that the oil and gas industry is a significant source of those emissions globally. Uh, and we also know from the work of the International Energy Agency and others that this is a readily solvable problem, that the technologies to address this challenge are very much within the reach of the industry. A 70% reduction based on technologies available to the industry today are certainly within reach. Um, and, and so we know as a practical matter, that this is something that can be addressed. It's a question of whether the industry and policymakers, um, will rise to the challenge. Uh, that is the, the fundamental question. Uh, but what's also interesting to me is, is that, um, as much as this is a, an environmental imperative, it's also, I believe, um, a commercial imperative and a commercial opportunity. Uh, last fall, the International Energy Agency, as part of its methane tracker work, uh, released an analysis that suggested that um, uh, a 90% reduction in flaring across the industry globally, a 70% reduction in venting and flaring across the uh, venting and leaks uh, across the industry globally, could yield 180 billion cubic meters of gas to the marketplace. This is gas that's already being mined or produced, however, whatever verb you want to use, right? It's already being produced, uh, but it's just being wasted. And just to put that 180 BCM in context, Europe today imports 155 BCM from Russia. So at a time when everyone's sort of wringing their hands, how is Europe going to decouple its gas market from, uh, from Russia? Um, where is that new gas going to come from? Well, I would suggest that the first place that we should all be looking is that gas which we're already producing but currently wasting. Uh, the United States alone, by our own calculations, the United States alone could provide 25 to 30 BCM to the global market uh, or to the domestic market for those people who are worried about the pop in gas prices here in the United States, 25 to 30 BCM if we achieved a 90% reduction in flaring in the US, if we achieved a 70% reduction in venting and flaring, and this goes really to Mary's point about the importance of US federal regulation. Um, what EPA has proposed is important, but it's not sufficient to get to the kind of reductions that I'm talking about. 
Um, much more work to be done on the flaring issue, much more work to be done on marginal wells, which are 50% of the problem. So we have an opportunity here to not only do something right for climate, but frankly, do something right for the cause of both national energy security and global energy security just by finding and fixing leaks and ending flaring. So um, that's the first point. The other two points I'll make quickly. The second point is, is that this really does come back around to the legitimacy, the referendum, if you will, the global referendum on exactly what is going to be the place of natural gas in the low carbon, zero carbon energy future. Um, you, you know, you spend time in Asia, you spend time in Africa, you spend time in developing parts of the world, and there is a real belief that natural gas needs to play a role in the energy transition in those regions. But I think fundamentally, gas is going to be challenged to do that uh, with legitimacy if the methane emission is, issue isn't, isn't addressed. So I think there is a legitimacy question here um, that's sort of... Um, um, you know, metaphysical, if you will, for the gas industry. Um, and, and that leads me to my third point. Um, you know, uh, the gas industry uh, likes to talk about the fact that, you know, they're in the business of moving molecules. And so today it may be methane and tomorrow it may be hydrogen and tomorrow it may also be CO2 that's captured from oil and gas operations. Well, the simple fact is, is that the industry is unable to get a handle on the methane issue. Right? It's going to be very hard to believe that the industry is going to do any better job uh, moving hydrogen around, hydrogen being a smaller, more slippery molecule than methane, so much harder to control as on first principles, and itself a powerful uh, greenhouse gas or has powerful greenhouse gas effects when it goes missing. Um, and so... Um, the ability of the uh, industry to manage the methane issue is really a stalking horse, a referendum on its ability to move into these next generation gases, hydrogen, CO2. Um, and so I think it's incumbent upon the industry to show that it can get a handle on this if it wants to be believed that it's going to be part of the longer term solution in terms of these other gases. Um, so uh, three very important reasons why um, we need to be talking about this. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. Um, and just to back up a point you made, I, I definitely agree that a lot of the focus at the World Gas Conference in Korea last week was on the future role of gas in a low carbon world. So high cost, and I think the the decarbonization challenge were really top of mind for a lot of participants. That was something that almost everyone talked about. Uh, and I also definitely agree that methane was on everyone's minds. And that's an industry-wide phenomenon at all these conferences now. Um, so let me get into the Q&A section now. Uh, thanks for those of you who have added questions into the chat. Some good ones have come in. Um, and we'll get to those in a bit. Mary, let me start with you. So BP has made its own interim targets to cut methane emissions. Uh, you've talked a little bit about specifically what you're gonna to do to cut operative emissions at your own facilities. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the timeline here. Um, there's always gonna be criticism that the industry is not moving quickly enough. Um, talk about the scale of the challenge and actually implementing those cuts at operations in the United States and BP's assets elsewhere in the world. Sure. Um... Thanks, Ben. And just echoing, I think, first, something that, that Mark said um, about the commercial opportunities. I think it just as um, just want to underscore that, yes, BP thinks it's, it's critical. We've got to do this because it's the right thing to do for the world. But it's, we also see tremendous business opportunity. And, and as, as Mark pointed out, keeping it in the pipes um, it means more, more product we can sell but at the same time, we, we think there's going to be an increased demand for um, a product that, you know, that we can somehow show and verify is um, a lower um, emission or somehow differentiated. And, and I'm, I know Mark and EDF has talked a lot about, you know, what, how do you certify or, or quantify that the gas um, really is uh, lower methane? But the, the point is, I think, just to underscore what Mark said, um, we, we do see tremendous business opportunity. 
And we also think it is critical for the future of gas that we, um, you know, that we the, that we do um, deal with the the methane issue. Um, but I think back to your question, will you just repeat that for me in terms of the the U.S. and global and what you were saying? Yeah, I mean, maybe you could just talk in more detail about the specific targets that BP is committed yeah. to to cut operating yeah. emissions and some of the challenges of doing this in the United States and other assets around yeah. the world. I think the key to all of this is is measurement and technologies that are currently available and the technologies that are developing so quickly. So at BP, um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that we have committed to um, uh, install you know, a measurement system at all our major oil and gas sites globally by 2023. And what does that mean? Um, when we think about the different technologies, um, there's the old handheld, you know, cameras, imaging cameras, um, but there's also the fixed wing aircraft, there's satellites, there's drones, there's um, continuous monitoring. So all of these different um, technologies we are we have in place now in the U.S. and we're trialing them all and have them all um, in our different assets um, in the U.S. And so we think the answer is not one technology or another. And I think what makes BP unique is that we are working on how do all of these things work together. Um, and so that's I think that's how we're approaching it both um, in the U.S. and globally. And you know, depending on the configuration of the site, the age of of the site and the wells, there's not a one size fits all. So we don't think there's one technology that is the silver bullet, but it's going to be this combination of technologies uh, that really, I think, um, get us there. And and then there's you know, how do you measure? How do you verify? Um, and those are some of the challenges. And I think EDF has really been a leader in that space. And in helping and pushing um, at the same time, companies like BP to to um, to really you know get there and 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 try these different technologies. So for us, as I said, it is installing or or putting in these different measurement systems um, globally at all our major oil and gas sites by 2023, and then publishing the data. That's going to be critical as well to drive then a 50% reduction in methane intensity by 2025. Um, so that's where we are. We're on a journey. And I think technology is really critical. And then, you know, measurement and verification. Yeah, Mary, let me stick with you for a minute. So you mentioned publishing data. There are some initiatives to try to get the industry to speak with one voice and provide consistent data. One of these is the Oil and Gas Methane Partnership or OGMP 2.0. I wonder if you could just talk about how the industry is trying to tackle this issue. Um, one of the problems I think is that there's not a whole lot of consistency between big companies, small companies, listed companies, and those who are not. Uh, and we do have these kind of associations of, of you know, of, of companies like OGNP. Um, but maybe you can talk a little bit about the, the type of data that you're being asked to provide by investors and the significance OG, of OGNP 2.0 in particular. Sure. I mean, I think OGMP 2.0, it's it's the premier global voluntary initiative. Um, and it's the only methane initiative that consists of governments, regulators, civil society, and um, industry. So, you know, we've been um, part of it. And when it launched for a number of years, but this since it's launched in 2020, um, it's it's really been something I think that globally we see as the the kind of the gold standards. Now, it, it doesn't take, it is a voluntary initiative, doesn't take the place of, um, you know, regulation here in the U.S., um, but it really, um, I think, especially for the EU and as a model for EU regulation is going to be critical. And it, it very much aligns with BP's strategy. The role of measurement, which I mentioned earlier, and moving away from emissions factors is going to be critical. And then it, you know, it speaks to addressing methane emissions, both from the operated and non-operated assets. And then it also speaks to the importance of, of setting clear targets um, um, on a measured basis. Um, so if for BP's case, that's 0.2% on a measured basis by 2020, 
five. Um, so, you know, again, it's not a replacement for regulation, but um, it really can help globally, I think, set the standard. And that's, and that's what we're seeing. In particular, I think it's going to be critical for the EU. Great. Thanks, Mary. Um, Mark, let me turn to you. One question I have for you is, we had all this acceleration of activity last fall, right? The EPA rules, the proposed legislation in Europe, the methane pledge. Are we moving fast enough to implementation? Are you worried that we're losing the sense of urgency? There's not a whole lot of time between now and 2030. So how do we keep pressure on companies to keep moving towards those targets? Well, um, a couple of things. So first of all, just want to echo the importance of uh, OGMP 2.0. Um, this really, as, as Mary points out, it's not a substitute for government action for regulation either in Europe or the United States or elsewhere in the world, for sure. Um, it's not a substitute for countries, you know, fulfilling their commitments under the Global Methane Pledge. But it is an important complement, and I think it is one of the ways in which um, industry can signal um, that it understands the magnitude of the challenge and that's serious getting after it. There are now over 75 companies globally that have committed to OGMP 2.0, um, BP being one of them, Shell being another, Total, any um, Oxy here in the United States, um, a number of other U.S. producers. I'll note that you know Exxon and Chevron have yet to uh, sign up to OGMP 2.0, and I'll just put in a little plug, Ben. Next week, I know you'll be you'll be talking, or your colleague will be talking with Mike Worth at at, uh, at Chevron. Uh, this is a good question to put to him. Um, you know, uh, because I think any company that is serious about getting after the methane issue has to really be committed to firm targets which is a feature of OGMP 2.0, um, meaningful targets, but also monitoring, measurement, and reporting, getting beyond those um, emission factors that are so uh, commonly used today, but we now know from field work really failed to accurately represent the magnitude of the issue. Um, and so OGMP 2.0, I think, is critical, and it gets to your point, right? One of the ways in which industry shows that it is moving forward um, is by participating in this program. Uh, but that by itself won't do it. Um, we do need, in fact, to see tangible um, uh, examples of countries moving forward past the proposal stage to the adoption of regulation. I would hope that by the time uh, the United States uh, gets to uh, um, the COP in, um, in Egypt in the fall, uh, that will have adopted regulation in the U.S. and will be moving on to uh, to implementation. The U.S., of course, it's important that the U.S. be a leader here. Uh, the U.S. continues to be the world's largest oil and gas producer. Um, and uh, so it's logical that the U.S. would have, um, you know, the best and strongest regulatory framework in the world and serve as a model for what other oil and gas producers uh, should be doing. So, um, but the last point I'll make here is the very monitoring technologies that Mary was talking about, the aircraft, the drones, the satellites. Um, these are technologies that are not just available to industry. Uh, increasingly, they're available to folks in civil society. In fact, we ourselves are developing a methane satellite uh, that should be in operation by next year. Uh, and so I think that one of the ways in which we spur action um, alongside government and industry, um, maybe in an effort to push them along a little faster, is we deploy these technologies ourselves. Um, and, uh, you know, as Ronald Reagan would say, you trust but verify. Uh, and so I think these technologies, because they are so uh, becoming so ubiquitous and frankly so affordable, um, it gives us the opportunity to put them into place and allows us um, to do our own assessment as to how industry is doing, to do our own assessment as to how state and federal regulators are doing. Um, we will be uh, later this year doing another set of overflights, not just in the Permian Basin, but across North America um, to really assess, you know, how well is the industry responding 
uh, to this challenge. Uh, and we hope that that kind of information is taken in the spirit in which it's intended, right? Which is with better information, we can do take better action. Um, and, uh, you know, um, you know, sometimes a, a, a report card is a good thing for inspiring a, a student to, uh, to try a little harder. Yeah, absolutely. And I take your point about the, the democratization of, of technology and the fact that it's getting cheaper. I think one of the challenges for the industry is just trying to figure out what's going to work and what's cost effective, what to invest in, because there's huge proliferation of all these technologies. Um, Mark, let me stick with you for a second. So you were just in Asia meeting with a lot of companies. I, I think your colleagues at EDF have been as well. I mean, it's clear that a lot of the progress on reducing methane from oil and gas is going to happen on the supply side. And the U.S., for the reasons you mentioned, you know, should be a leader in this regard. Hopefully the EPA rules and other things will, will make that happen. Uh, what's your sense of how actors outside Europe and North America are moving on methane emissions? What did you take away from all the had with gas buyers and others in Asia in recent weeks? Well, I'm 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 encouraged uh, by the conversations that we had uh, in Japan, in South Korea, and Southeast Asia. I think, first of all, number one, I think there's a growing recognition of the science that we we're not going to win on the climate issue simply by reducing carbon dioxide, although we must. Uh, but that, uh, alongside efforts to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, we also have to reduce methane emissions, right? Methane emissions being about the rate of warming, carbon dioxide being about the total amount of warming our planet will experience over time. And what the IPCC and the other science is telling us is we need to focus on both of those things to have a comprehensive strategy to address climate change. I think that is becoming much better understood um, in Asia, whether you're talking about Japan or Korea or Southeast Asia. So I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing is um, there's rising recognition on the part of, you know, inside Japan and Korea, that as two of the largest markets for natural gas anywhere in the world, and likely to be markets that will exist for decades to come, given the energy realities of those two countries, that there is a, um, a, a responsibility um, to, uh, to work uh, not only, uh, well, to work with Southeast Asian suppliers in a collaborative way to reduce methane emissions associated with the gas that comes into uh, South Korea and Japan, but also a growing recognition that there are steps that those countries themselves can take to better understand what emissions are associated with gas distribution and use and how to get after them. So a lot of conversations in with uh, in South Korea about the gas utility system and the use of gas in transportation and you know what's really known about the emissions patterns associated with that and how to make sure that those uses um, are um, are um, addressed in a way that that you know methane emissions are 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 you know taken into account. Um, we just signed uh, last week. Uh, memorandum of understanding with Seoul National University, the Graduate School of Environment, which is the, the first and most prominent of the schools of, um, uh, of environment in, in South Korea. And we'll be working with them on strategies to improve the science and the understanding of methane emissions in South Korea. And uh, that includes both, uh, you know, uh, gas uses within the country, but also gas imports. Um, so I think there's a recognition um, that there's a ro role for them to play here. And uh, frankly, I think there's an excitement. I mean, Japan itself has a robust satellite uh, program. Uh, Korea is developing a satellite program. So a lot of conversations there, too, about how uh, the work of those um, space agencies uh, can be incorporated into the global community of um, information gathering, uh, that's taking place through the International Methane Emi Emissions Observatory. So, um, really, some some really positive stuff I think beginning to happen in Asia. Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, we have a ton of questions coming into the Q and A feature. We won't be able to get to them all, but um, let me try to ask a couple. 
Uh, Mary, let me start with you. One question that came through is, uh, do oil and gas companies have sufficient financial incentive to reduce methane emissions? Do some just see flaring, venting as the cost of doing business? I think if you want to broaden this out a little bit, you can say, um, what's really driving a company like BP to cut methane emissions? Is it just <laughs> fear of financial penalties? Is it pressure from shareholder and shareholders and investors? And maybe you can talk about you know, with EPA regulations, how BP is engaged in, in trying to, um, you know, support regulations that would have clear directives for things like uh, flaring, replacing leaky equipment, you know, um, replacing compressors and valves and other things that are known to leak. So the financial costs to a company like BP, the drivers for cutting, and maybe how you're trying to inform the regulations and support them. Sure. Um Thanks, Ben, and thanks for the question. I think uh, I talked a little bit about this earlier um, in terms of, you know, it's the right thing to do for the world, but there's also um, commercial opportunity. You keep the keep the methane in the pipes and you can sell it. Um, we talked a little bit about demand, this being driven by demand and customers um, wanting some, you know, differentiated. And, and again, how do we get there and how do we verify that? But but it seems like there is a there's a lot of um, you know we see the business opportunity there, but um, you know it's also the investors and shareholders and uh, and that that pressure is um, is there and I think it's it's the right kind of pressure and we see that and we're in conversations um, so business opportunity there is the shareholder um, investor and then you know as governments um, regulate. We want to be ahead of the curve. Um, we want to, you know, we're not waiting for regulation. We're in action, but we think um, regulation is critical, uh, levels the playing field. So, um, you know, I think there's lots of reasons um, companies are in action um, for BP. First and foremost, it's the right thing to do. There's business opportunity, but but there's also these others, um, you know, the investors and shareholders, um, as well as um, the government regulations. So um, that's kind of, I think, the, the why are we doing this? Um, on the EPA regulation, we've been, you know, engaged in this um, with the EPA for, for quite some time um, because we are, we are in action and we are sort of piloting a lot of different technologies. And, you know, our hope is that by um, sharing some of the data and helping you know, EPA see that you you actually can um, achieve the results um, that I think we all want to see. You can you can achieve those. And is there some kind of performance standard um, where you can say, here's where you need to get, and then use a variety of technologies to get there? I think that's um, that's hopefully where we'd like to see um, the regulation come out. Um, but you know, there's a there's lots of different factors that go into play here, and and legal precedent, and the the rules that the EPA has to, or the the um, you know they they've got to adhere to to their statute as well. So you know, we continue to work with them and and try to show them the results that we're having by piloting and using um, a variety of technologies um, to get the kind of results that we want to see. Great, thanks, Mary. Um, Mark, let me turn to you. Uh, we've just got a couple minutes left, but to group together a couple questions here, a few people have asked about the problem of transferred emissions. You know, we have lots of producers in the United States, good actors, bad actors, listed companies, small companies. How do we tackle the issue of companies just selling assets to producers that don't have the same set of standards? Um, and, you know, whether that's a private equity backed company or privately held company, how do we get around that issue? How do we tackle all of it so we can reduce emissions from the whole sector? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And actually, uh, you know, we did a report on this just a couple of weeks ago, which show that there is a substantial uptick in the amount of divestment that's taking place. I mean, you know, trade, you know, selling of assets is, is a time honored tradition inside the oil and gas industry. It's a little bit like, you know, baseball cards, people sh shuffle them and trade them all the time. But uh, but we have noticed an uptick in that activity. I think as as in fact companies begin to reshape their portfolios in either pursuit of decarbonization 
strategies that they have or preparing themselves uh, for the low carbon future, we're noticing an uptick in the sell-off of assets um, and, and a noticeable trend you know, in terms of assets that are currently being held by companies that have, um, you know, um, Paris-based climate targets, methane management targets, uh, ESG uh, management systems to companies that, um, that in fact don't have these, these basic structures in place, either, um, not either to national oil companies or to um, or to uh, companies held by uh, private equity, um, and and it's a concern. Um, and so we're working now with folks in the investment community. We're working with folks in the industry to actually develop a set of principles that would begin to address what responsible asset divestment looks like. Now, without getting too far ahead of ourselves, right? Um, you know, one would expect to see that, you know, principles in place would begin to um, uh, shape the behavior of companies and those that finance them in terms of what is an acceptable asset divestiture churn, what is not. Um, and what kind of what kind of assurances need to be in place before an asset can move from a company that's currently reasonably well managed to a company that doesn't have that same kind of infrastructure in place or track record in place? What are the kind of uh, conditions that need to be met? But I would also say that for as much as the press is focused on uh, the companies dealing the assets and their motives for doing so, we can't lose sight of the fact that what what we ultimately need to do uh, is bring companies in the private equity community into um, the world where they are actually managing their assets responsibly. We need to continue the process of reaching out to and engaging national oil companies to put in place uh, Paris compliant decarbonization targets, to put in place methane management, to put in place ESG uh, management systems. And in fact, we can point to examples of some national oil companies that are beginning to do that, such as Petronas in Malaysia or Qatar Energy in Qatar. Um, so it's not a mission impossible uh, to think that we could get more national oil companies constructively engaged in the conversation about methane management and decarbonization. Uh, but we don't have nearly enough of those companies yet. And, uh, you know, we might get to a place in time when the majority of these companies have the right management systems in place and this becomes less of an issue. So we wanna make sure that the assets are, are, are being dealt to companies that have good management practices in place. And we need to make sure in turn that national oil companies, companies owned by private equity firms actually have those systems. And I think that, that, is, uh, that that's the challenge ahead of us. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, we're a little bit over time, but maybe if I can ask you to stick around for another minute or two, maybe just one question. I'd love to get final thoughts from both of you on this. The situation in Europe has created real concerns about energy security. There's a need to displace Russian gas. We know that Russian gas is prone to lots of methane leaks from long pipeline systems and old infrastructure. What is the opportunity for the United States to step up and provide cleaner, less emissions intensive LNG to Europe and to the world? Um, and maybe Mary, I'll start with you to tackle that question and uh, turn to you, Mark, for final thoughts. Well, let me sort of broaden your question a little bit because I think it's one um, given BP's global footprint and um, you know that that we're getting on on what do you think? What is the impact of of what's happening in Europe and and Russia on on the energy transition and um, and energy security for? especially um, Europe. And I think we see it really as um, accelerating the energy transition. And so as all of these um, European countries in particular that were um, so dependent on Russian molecules are, you know, looking around, they're looking at what are, what are the options? What are the alternatives? Um, and in some cases that may be US LNG. It may also be, um, 
you know, wind and solar, hydrogen. So for a company like BP operating globally, um, and as I mentioned in the opening, transitioning from an international oil company to an integrated energy company trying to provide solutions, that's where I think we can um, hopefully play a role um, and and help as these countries are thinking about how to um, their own energy security. What what role can BP play? And and it is that hydrocarbons? Is it um, renewables? But what you know, helping them with their energy solutions, I think, is is where I see BP playing. Great, Mark. Yeah, well, yeah, Ben, I would just jump in and say that, uh, you know, the World Bank has been tracking the amount of gas that's flared around the world. And uh, the most recent report, I think Russia was either number one or number two in the world in terms of flared gas. Uh, um, well, the United States is number four. Okay. Um, you know, well ahead of most countries uh, in, uh, you know, uh, oil and gas countries. Um, and so, you know, I might suggest that, you know, people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Um, the U.S. has a lot of work to do here. Um, we, I think we have all the potential to be a first class oil and gas producer. And what I mean by that is a, 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 a country that produces oil and gas without methane emissions, without flaring, without venting, without leaks. But we are f a long way from actually achieving that. Uh, so we have work to do. Um, and that means a comprehensive set of regulations that deals uh, not only with uh, large companies and large producers, but also deal with marginal wells that are 50% of the problem in the US. Uh, and that also means um, you know, national standards that essentially put an end to the practice of, of routine flaring, which is so common right now in the Permian um, and the Bakken. Um, we have to do better if we really want to be able to say that we are a producer of choice uh, for the rest of the world that is increasingly concerned about the greenhouse gas footprint of, 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 gas, of gas production and gas use. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. Well, I think we'll have to draw things to a close here. Um, thank you for all the great questions that came in. I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to them all, but the conversation will definitely continue. Um, I want to thank Mary Street from BP, Mark Brownstein from EDF. Um, it was great to get your views. Thanks to everyone who joined us. Uh, the conversation will continue. CSIS will continue this work on methane emissions. I think what I heard today is that there is an encouraging alignment between, in some cases, companies and government and regulations, between the investor community and companies, and, and definitely advocacy organizations will keep pushing everyone, but we have a long way to go. So thanks to everyone for joining us, and have a good day.